Thank you for joining Shelby and me as we continue reading October Sky. Today we're starting on chapter seven. The title of this chapter is Cape Colwood. Let's get started. Dad wasn't interested in him, so Quentin escaped from Colwood, hitching a ride at the mine entrance. The other boys, I assumed, had gone home to hunker down for the day, hoping without much hope that their parents wouldn't hear about our errant rocket. Dad ordered me to walk home. He followed about an hour later and called me out into the yard. I waited while he went down in the basement and returned with my chemicals in a cardboard box. Come with me, he said. I want you to see this. I followed him out the back gate and then watched as he poured everything into the creek. I knew he was justifiably angry considering how stupid I'd been to launch our uncontrolled missiles so close to the mine. On the other hand, these were my chemicals paid for with my money. I'd gotten up on a lot of cold, snowy mornings to deliver the paper and earn that money. This is the end of it, he said over his shoulder as he shook out the last bag of saltpeter. And this time, I mean it. Collect stamps, catch frogs, keep bugs in a jar, do whatever you want, but no more rockets. He handed me the box filled with empty bottles and bags. Now, who helped you? I remained silent, but he said, Bykovsky, got to be. I felt my face involuntarily slide into an expression of dismay. Was there anything in Colwood my dad didn't know about? I'll take care of him, he assured me. What are you gonna do? I asked urgently. That's none of your business, little man. Now go up to your room and stay there until your mother gets home. When mom got home, dad stopped her at the door. I could hear them talking, but not exactly what was being said. Then I heard her thump up the stairs. She came into my room. Tell me what happened, she said warily. I gave her the whole story about Mr. Bykovsky and everything. I wondered where you were sneaking off to in the night, she said after I finished. Don't look so surprised. You think I don't know what goes on in this house? Are you going to help me? She shook her head. I don't see how I can. The Ohio men told Mr. Van Dyke what happened. Your dad's pretty embarrassed and I guess he has a right to be. What should I do? I don't know. You messed up pretty good this time. I guess I'm finished, I said. If you give up that easy, she replied with a shrug, I guess you are. I'm worried about Mr. Bykovsky, I said, looking for sympathy. You should be, she answered coldly. You used him. Ike and Mary have always had a special liking for you and you knew it. You should have thought of what could have happened to him before you got him involved. I sweated out the rest of the day, and then, as soon as the shift change was made, slunk up to see Mr. Bykovsky. I was relieved to see him in his shop. He was working on the big steel cutting law of a continuous mining machine. He saw me at the door and waved me inside. You see, Sonny, he said, pointing at the mom. The operator hit rock instead of coal. The teeth have been broken off. I will build new ones. I picked up one of the broken teeth on his work table and fingered it. Did, did my dad talk to you? Your father was pretty mad, he said over a shriek of a milling machine. This is my last night in the machine shop. He reassigned me to the mine. I'll be operating a loader on the evening shift. Revulsion and shame welled up inside me. I had acted stupidly, but dad's reaction was vile and despicable. My dad's the meanest man in this town, I erupted angrily. Mr. Bykovsky stopped the milling machine and came over and grabbed me by my shoulder, giving me a good shake. You must not say this about your father. He is a good man. I acted without his permission and I deserve to be punished. He released me and patted me on the side of my arm. He smiled, a sad smile. Anyway, perhaps it is a good thing he has done. I will make more money loading coal. I'm sorry, Mr. Bykovsky, I said. My mom said I took advantage of you and she's right. Look, I have something for you, he said. 
He went to the tool crib and carried out a cardboard box. Inside were four new ox, complete with wooden nose cones. I already had them made up. They should keep you going for a while. Now, go on, I have much work to do. I clutched the box as if it were filled with gold and diamonds. I'll never be able to thank you enough. You wanna thank me? He nodded toward the box. Make these fly. Show your dad what you and I did together. My father had clearly, in no uncertain terms, told me to stop building rockets. The BCMA was now an outlaw organization. I don't know why, but that felt good. I had the urge to hug Mr. Bykovsky, but resisted it. Instead, I stood straight and tall and said firmly, and what I hope was manfully, yes, sir, you can count on me. He nodded and went back to work. So did I. On the following Monday, I gathered the boys in the Big Creek Auditorium before morning classes. As expected, the gossip fence had instantly informed their parents about our assault on the tipple. Surprisingly, all of the other boys had gotten off without punishment. Roy Lee's mother had laughed it off. Odell's father thought it was pretty amazing the rockets had flown at all. And after all, no harm had been done. Sherman's father had counseled him to think about things a little more before he did them, but that was all. I was the only one who'd been yelled at. When I reflected on it, I suspected the other parents thought it was funny that we had spooked the Ohio men, who were not exactly beloved by the average Colwoodian. I'd heard Roy Lee, who got the union talk from his brother, say the steel mill muckety mucks were far more interested in themselves than us that they'd sell us down the river in a second. My father, on the other hand, believed a major part of his work was keeping the men from Ohio happy. Well, I had myself to keep happy. I've got to get a new rocket range someplace out of Colwood, I told the boys. You mean we're not quitting, Odell asked. We're outlaws now, I said, savoring the word. We're not ever going to quit. Sherman was with me. They clear cut all the timber off Pine Knob, he said. It's not on company property. We could go up there. Are you kidding, Roy Lee Gright? We'd have to climb two mountains to get up there. Do you have a better plan, Sherman countered? I sure do. How about we stop all this rocket stuff and get us some girlfriends? That interested Odell. How do we do that? First, I need to teach you the ropes. Like what? Roy Lee's eyebrows went up and down, like unsnapping a bra with one hand. Pine up it is, I've decided, ignoring Roy Lee's nonsense. This Saturday, meet at my house. We'll leave from there. Quentin, yo, Quentin answered, shaken from some distant reverie. We need to figure out a better way to test our mixes other than just throwing them into the hot water heater. You're supposed to be our scientist. Can you think of some way to do that? Of course, do it. On Saturday, while dad was at the mine, the BCMA met in my room. Quentin had labored over a way to test our powder all week and proudly presented his plan. It was a complicated test stand with tubes and springs and pistons. I was impressed. It looked like something Werner von Braun himself might have dreamed up. Odell was the first to speak after Quentin's breathless explanation of how it all worked. How about we just put the powder in a pot bottle and see how big an explosion it makes? A course of agreement followed. Everybody looked at me to make the decision. Pot bottle, I decided. I hated to disappoint Quentin, but we had no way to build his design with our limited resources. But good job anyway, Q, I said. I had already figured out. It never hurt to give somebody a pat on the back. Quentin protested. Sonny, we must approach this enterprise in a scientific manner. We are, Quentin, I told him calmly, but we have to sometimes take into account we're not at Cape Canaveral. Quentin appealed to the other boys lounging around the room. We're trying to learn how to build a rocket, gentlemen. This isn't for fun. How right you are, Quentin, Roy Lee said, winking at me. That's what girls are for. From his jacket pocket, he brought out a brazier 
and wrapped it around a chair. Okay, as I promised, it is time to watch and learn, boys. Quentin sighed in exasperation. I crowded in with Sherman and Odell. We were eager to learn Roy Lee's adult secrets. Roy Lee sat down in the chair beside the one with the bra and draped his arm around its top. After a moment of deftly fingering the attachments in the back, the bra fell apart. Wow, we all said in unison, even Quentin. He picked up the bra and inspected the complicated hooks and loops in the back. You know, he cogitated, his brow furring. There should be a better system. He plucked a beggar's lice endemic in West Virginia off his pants leg and inspected the tiny fuzzy seed that hitched rides on anything or anybody who walked through the woods. Dandy and Poteet used to come back from chasing rabbits covered with them, and I'd spent hours picking them off. Quentin put the seed back on his pants and then pulled it up again. I'd like to look at this under a microscope. If you could figure out what makes it stick to your pants, you could maybe put it on cloth straps and... Shut up, Quentin, Roy Lee said, snatching the bra from him and strapping it to the chair again. You think too much. One by one, we each took our turn at the thing. I'd seen lots of brassiers hanging outside the wash lines up and down Colwood, but I'd never had occasion to touch one before. Unhooking it one-handed wasn't nearly as easy as Roy Lee had made it look. The top hook was the hardest. Dorothy would have slapped you silly by now, Roy Lee told me. Don't talk about Dorothy that way, I bristled. Why? She's no angel. I heard she's dating some boy over in Welch. That was news to me. The kids in Welch were considered fast by the rest of us in the county. If she was going out with a boy from there, I felt butterflies in my stomach. Just let it be, Roy Lee, I snapped, suddenly miserable. It seemed everything about Dorothy either made me happy or very sad. Roy Lee gave me his best innocent look and held up his hands. Okay, but don't say you didn't know about it. We kept up our bra work the rest of the afternoon until we all had it down to a science, even Quentin, who finally gave in to Roy Lee's vivid descriptions of what might occur if you could master such a handy talent. After the other boys filed out of the house, Roy Lee with the bra hidden back in his jacket, Mom stopped Quentin and asked him to stay for supper. He gave her his little bow. I'd be delighted, Mrs. Hickam, just for the pleasure of your company. She grinned with delight. Sonny, why don't you have manners like Quentin? My upbringing, I asked. <laughs> a smart mouth could get a boy in trouble, she warned. You've really got the basement in a mess. You wanna clean it up down there? Yes, ma'am, I said, and reminded myself that my mother was never a person to cross, even a little.